In March, a scientific journal published a paper defending the theory that Boasian anthropology, Freudian psychology, multiculturalism, Marxism, and left-wing political movements in general are best understood in terms of Jewish group evolutionary strategy. These Jewish ideologies, we are told, promote Jewish group interests by weakening the white population's sense of nationalism, religiosity, and ethnocentrism. It is also claimed that this group evolutionary strategy manifests itself in the overrepresentation of Jews in the leadership of cultural, academic, and political domains that have been tainted by cultural Marxism. This theory is obviously nothing more than the delusions of a neo-Nazi crank. Originating with the open white nationalist Kevin MacDonald, it's basically every anti-Semitic conspiracy theory you've ever heard dressed up in pseudo-Darwinian clothes. But this wasn't published in some fringe journal. It was published in Evolutionary Psychological Science, a spring and nature journal with leaders in the field like David Buss and Steven Pinker sitting on its editorial board. If this surprises you, it probably shouldn't. Semi-mainstream scientific journals are littered with bogus race science just like this. Hell, this paper itself was part of an exchange with a rival scholar who claimed in another paper, in another journal, that Jewish overrepresentation in the leadership of these movements can be best explained in terms of racial differences in innate intelligence. So how did we get to this point, where mainstream scientific journals are hosting a debate on the finer details of the Jewish question? In this video, we'll see how this is the result of a concerted effort at entryism into academia by a network of far-right activists. This is the story of how Nazi money continued to corrupt the sciences long after the Second World War, by funding fringe scholars and selectively funding semi-mainstream research. It is the story of how former members and active supporters of the National Socialist German Workers' Party, along with their ideological successors, infiltrated academia and set up fake scientific institutions to advance their racist ideology, institutions which still exist to this day. The story starts with an eccentric American millionaire named Wycliffe Draper, who, having inherited his father's textile empire and more money than he knew how to spend, became a kind of anti-philanthropist throwing vast sums of money at various bad causes. He became a major donor to the American Eugenics Society and funded the publication of white supremacist literature out of his own pocket. His involvement in the cause became more direct after travelling to Nazi Germany to attend the International Congress for the Scientific Investigation of Population Problems, presided over by Reich Minister Wilhelm Frick. No points for guessing which populations were the problems. Following the conference, Draper teamed up with Harry Laughlin, a man whose views were considered extreme even among other eugenicists, having written a draft of what would become the Third Reich's forced sterilization law. Together, in 1937, the two men founded the Pioneer Fund, whose purpose was described as that of race betterment, a goal they intended to promote by arranging screenings of Nazi propaganda films in the United States. After the war, the appetite for Nazi-style eugenics rapidly faded, and Draper retreated to funding the Back to Africa movement, which offered financial incentives for African Americans to leave the United States, along with a range of other pro-segregationist causes. As part of his effort to oppose desegregation, Draper funded people like Henry Garrett, a former president of the American Psychological Association, who testified as an expert witness in Brown v. Board of Education and other court cases in support of segregation, and also people like Carlton Putnam, who was a leading segregationist and popularizer of scientific racism, as espoused by Garrett and by his cousin Carlton Kuhn, who was then president of the American Association of Physical Anthropologists, and who was one of the last big names in the old guard of scientific racism. The battles over segregation in the 50s had demonstrated the powerful role that science could play in the propaganda war on both sides. However, the scientific consensus was fast turning against the racialist agenda. This is likely when the idea occurred to him. What if Draper and his allies could make their own alternative science? And so the Pioneer Fund was reinvented as a private research council, issuing grants to sympathetic researchers and to projects whose results could likely be abused for propaganda purposes. Over the decades, the Pioneer Fund would issue millions of dollars in grants in the fields of genetics, anthropology, and psychology, 
Some of these recipients were creatures of the Pioneer Fund, often independent scholars who were outright neo-Nazis, but others worked within mainstream academia. The factor which united them was that the research being funded was useful in opposing racial equality, and their influence was considerable. Among the recipients of their grants was Arthur Jensen, whose research brought the race IQ controversy back into the mainstream. It funded the side projects of the prestigious psychologist Hans Eisenach, who developed an obsession with comparing the IQs of various ethnic groups. At the height of his career, Eisenach was the most widely cited living psychologist. It also funded, alongside the Koch Foundation, the Minnesota study of twins read apart, at the time one of the largest adoption studies, which found IQ to be highly heritable. Whenever 20th century psychology as a discipline indulged, as it often would, in misguided efforts to weigh the influence of nature against nurture, the well-financed pioneer fund would be there with its thumb on the scales. But even with these successes, getting some of their more outrageous claims published was an uphill battle. Luckily for Draper, and unluckily for the integrity of science, a solution to this problem would be found by one of his young grant recipients from across the pond. As a young man, Roger Pearson lost much of his family to the war. Such a tragedy would weigh heavily on any young man. But the way in which this affected Pearson was not to leave him with a lasting hatred of the Nazis or of war in general. Instead, he came to see the war as a pointless conflict, in which kindred nations fought among themselves at the instigation of the true enemy, the Jews, who had sought to carry out the genocide of the German nation. Instead of seeking out a good therapist, he set up the Northern League, a pan-Germanic neo-Nazi group, and began writing articles on the merits of killing the disabled for magazines with subtle names like White Power, the revolutionary voice of National Socialism. Alongside his British following, which included future British National Party founder John Tyndall, Pearson was joined in the League by many former Nazi Party members, including former Waffen-SS officers on Heinrich Himmler's personal staff, and prominent Nazi racial theorists. Several American white supremacists linked to Draper also joined the group, including Professor Garrett. Through the League, Pearson, who had been receiving Pioneer Fund money to write crank articles, met Robert Geyer, a retired British Army officer and dilettante. Together, with the funding provided by Draper, they established a journal of their own, Mankind Quarterly. Geyer and Pearson were joined on the editorial team of a new journal by Henry Garrett and Otmar von Verscher, a German racial hygienist best known for his collaboration with Joseph Mengele on his infamous twin experiment. Von Verscher worked off-site, receiving shipments of blood samples for analysis, as well as both partial and intact human remains from those murdered at the Auschwitz camp by Mengele. Over the years, Draper, Pearson and their heirs would set up various other journals and bogus scientific institutions, with professional sounding names like the Institute for the Study of Man, or the Ulster Institute for Social Research, but it's Mankind Quarterly which endures as the central pillar of scientific racism. One of Draper's last investments before his death was to fund the publication of a book, The Dispossessed Majority which asserted that West Germany's post-war economic miracle was attributable to the fact that it was now free of Jewish financial domination. So these guys were awful. But does any of this matter today? After all, many companies and their founders said and did terrible things back then. That doesn't mean they're all still Nazis. This really breaks down into two questions. First, does their research output continue to reflect their ideological origins? And secondly, is their research still lacking merit? So let's find out. In 2013, the current head of the Pioneer Fund, Richard Lynn, published a paper on racial differences in penis size. He concluded that what he called the Negroid race is indeed dowed with both superior length and girth. So why did he do this? I know what you're probably thinking. That Lynn read somewhere that scientific racists used to measure heads and misunderstood. But the truth is actually a lot dumber than that. To understand why racists obsessed with IQ differences are so often also obsessed with differences in penis size, we need to first familiarise ourselves with the legacy of Canadian psychologist Philippe Rushton. Rushton was one of those professors who churn out a decade or two of unremarkable but mainstream research, get tenure, then immediately pivot to promoting their own crackpot ideas, abusing their status for credibility with the public and as a shield against censure. 
Rushton, who preceded Lynn as head of the Pioneer Fund, spent the last few decades of his career developing and publicising his pet pseudo-historical theory of the evolution of human races. Yes, that's races, plural. You see, Rushton appropriated an archaic biological taxonomy in which humans are subdivided into three main subspecies, or races, Caucasoids, Mongoloids, and Negroids. These races are imagined to be distinct lineages, subject to a highly divergent natural selection, becoming adapted to suit the environmental conditions of their respective continents, and with little flow of genetic information between them. Such theories had been common in anthropology until the mid-20th century, but had been swept aside by the Neo-Darwinians. Rushton's innovation was to pair this racial model with a newer, less tainted theory. RK selection is a real, albeit now dated, theory in ecology, which posited that natural selection produces a correlation between the population density of an environment and the level of parental investment exhibited by the species that inhabit it. In more crowded and hence stable environments, species would evolve so as to favour greater parental investment in each individual offspring, so that they might better compete for scarce resources. Such species are said to be K-strategists. In contrast, sparsely populated environments have little competition for resources, and reproductive fitness is maximised by adopting a quantity over quality approach to breeding. These species are said to be R-strategists. Archetypal case strategists will produce fewer offspring, both per cycle and overall, exhibit longer gestation periods, will live longer and take many years to reach full maturity, and will have both parents invested in providing for and raising their offspring. Conversely, archetypal R strategists will give birth to many offspring or lay many eggs at a time, will have more offspring overall, rapidly reach maturity, live fast, die young, and are abandoned by both parents shortly after birth or hatching, if not sooner. Humans and elephants are highly K-selected species, while mice and insects are highly R-selected. Rushton argued that his three races of humans have undergone different levels of K-selection, with Asians being the most K-selected and Africans the least. In support of this idea, Rushton drew up a list of human traits that he believed would depend on degree of K-selectedness. The more K-selected races, he claimed, would be more intelligent, more altruistic and cooperative, have more complex social structures, have children who take longer to reach sexual maturity, be strictly monogamous, highly value education, and have bigger brains, while the more R-selected races would be more passionate, violent, promiscuous, prone to criminality, prone to selfishness and individualism, have larger genitalia, and be more likely to have twins, have more children overall, and be prone to parental absenteeism. Rushton then produces evidence appearing to show that for each of these traits, the three races are consistently ordered into the same hierarchy, with Asians exhibiting the most strongly K-selected traits, and Africans the most strongly are selected. He doesn't imagine whites at the top of a hierarchy of races, objectively superior to the races below them in all characteristics that are deemed important. In this way, Rushton's is a more subtle form of white supremacist ideology than most that came before him. Instead, Rushton imagines whites as occupying a golden mean between the two undesirable extremes. The Asians, who he imagines as a race of effete, conformist, sexless nerds, and the Africans, who are imagined as a race of aggressive, dumb, promiscuous jocks. By making claims about both physiological and behavioural differences, it was easier for him to play down the idea that cultural and socio-economic factors caused these differences than it was for those who focused on IQ exclusively. Now you can probably see why Rushton's disciples, of whom Lin is the de facto leader, are so obsessed with measuring penises. Differences in penis size are difficult to explain away by cultural or socio-economic factors. In 1987, Rushton published a paper compiling evidence in support of this theory, central to which was the observation that the penises of African men are significantly larger than those of European or Asian men. But he didn't cite any lab studies that measured penis length. Instead, his main source for this claim was a book titled Untrodden Fields of Anthropology, Observations on the Esoteric Manners and Customs of Semi-Civilized Peoples, being a record of 30 years' <coughs> experience in Asia, Africa, America, and Oceania. It was published in 1898 by an anonymous French army surgeon. What kind of scientific research is published anonymously, you may very well ask. Well, this kind. 
The Vormonger has a varied choice of exotic flowers, ranging from the Negress to the Misty. The full blood Negress, to please her and become her lover, does not necessitate any long or complicated proceedings. You met a girl, talked to her a bit, and after a few commonplace phrases, if her face, as seen by the light of the match, pleased you, you put the regular question, darling, where can you sleep with me? You had but to follow the girl to a room in some neighboring house. If need be, one of the benches would afford you free hospitality. The conduct in the women's convents is far from being as it should be. Girls are seldom led there by religious convictions. There is very great debauchery in these convents, and that to such an extent that there is a Chinese proverb which says, The nun is the wife of the monk, and the monk is the slave of the nun. Who knew science could be so titillating? The book goes on like this for a couple of hundred pages of pornography thinly veiled as ethnography. Somehow, Professor Rustin manages to calculate from this the average penis lengths of the Europeans, Asians and Africans. He doesn't explain how he arrived at these figures, and they don't even seem to appear in the book as reported. What's surprising about Rushton's use of this book as his main source, besides the fact that it's basically a series of erotic anecdotes from a Victorian sex tourist, is the fact that it doesn't even seem to support his theory all that well. To be sure, there's plenty of passages in which our intrepid hero describes the superior dimensions of the black member. But there are also observations that outright contradict Rushton's claims. For example, when describing the anatomy and behaviour of Vietnamese men, the surgeon has this to say. The monkey is the only animal which masturbates intentionally. The animite, one of the oldest of civilised beings, is as lascivious as the monkey. It completely contradicts his prediction as concerns libido. The surgeon also reports that while black men often have very large penises, they have much smaller testes, an observation which, if true, would be difficult to reconcile with greater R selection. Somehow the scientific community weren't immediately convinced by Rushton's evidence, and so the task fell to his disciple, Richard Lynn, to bravely pursue this line of inquiry wherever it may lead. So how does Lynn measure up? Lynn claims that new data from 113 countries supports Rushton's thesis. Lynn didn't collect any data himself, I'm sensing a pattern here, nor did he create his own meta-analysis. Instead, he cites an now-defunct website that looks like something from the GeoCities era. The website collected results of studies that mention penis size from across the world. On the basis of this listing of sources, the website created a ranking of penis size by country. This is the basis for Lynn pronouncing the success of Rushton's theory. The data, as you may expect from a novelty website ranking penis sizes by country, has some problems with it. While some of the sources are genuine scientific papers, others are of more questionable provenance, including one source which appears to be an advertisement for a penis enlargement product in a men's magazine. And, as pointed out by a blogger back at the time, Many of the results reported on the website don't match that reported by the original source. These errors are copied over into Lynn's paper. Another problem is that the data isn't broken down by race at all, but by country. Lynn solves this by grouping countries into racial categories, but no methodology is given to justify these categorizations, nor is there any reason to suppose that samples in the studies are representative of the ethnic makeup of these countries. And the problems don't stop there. For many countries used in Lin's analysis, the only data available was self-report data. Yes, that's self-reported penis size. At this point, I came up with the wild hypothesis that the racial differences Lin had found were due to self-report studies being more common for the African countries. And sure enough, the greatest percentage of self-reports were for the so-called Negroid countries, with no self-report data at all used for the mongoloid countries. I think it's pretty obvious what happened here. Lin even notes the anomalous results for the mixed-race nations, focusing on Venezuela, where they apparently have very large penises, and Cape Verde, where they apparently have very small penises, and puts this down to a sampling error. Guess which one of these two results is based on self-report data, and which is not. Note also that self-reported penis length is given to the nearest 0.1mm. What do you think these people were self-measuring with, a laser? 
OK, so the evidence is a non-starter. But what about the theory behind it? Here too we run into problems from the outset. At no point do Russia nor Lynn stop to establish any clear link between penis length and fertility. An even more fundamental problem of Rushton's version of RK theory is that many of the traits attributed by Rushton to either R or K selection have no clear relationship to either. Indeed, altruism is identified by Rushton as a K strategy, but K selection occurs in environments with greater inter-individual competition for resources, which does not obviously favour altruism over selfishness. Also, there's no clear reason why colder Eurasian environments would result in greater case selection, as claimed by Rushton. This is a pretty fundamental problem with the theory. In summary, the research output of Rushton and Lin, the two most recent heads of the Pioneer Fund, is, in methodological terms, complete trash, and shows clear ideological continuity with the fund's origins. By the way, just in case anyone's curious about the real group differences in penis size, I produced this helpful chart. But why churn out all this pseudoscientific twaddle in the first place? Surely no one takes it seriously. One audience is far-right activists and alternative media, but these guys manage to get themselves cited in semi-mainstream science disturbingly often. Sadly, people often don't check sources as closely as they ought to, and if you want a source to support a particular claim and don't especially care how sound it is, then the Pioneer Fund slash Mankind Quarterly Network offer up a treasure trove of resources for the unprincipled contrarian. This seems to be part of the strategy, building up a base of bad facts which can then be cited to get a slightly milder version published in a more legitimate journal. To get an idea for how this works, take a look at the reference list from the anti-Semitic paper mentioned at the start of this video. More than half of these sources have at least one co-author directly associated with the Pioneer Fund, Mankind Quarterly, or the Ulster Institute. Some of the names should now be familiar. Those that I'm not including in that figure include sources like The Bell Curve and The Daily Stormer. Of those sources that aren't directly connected to the network, many rely heavily on citations of papers written by those who are, including The Bell Curve. Finally, lest there be any lingering doubt about the nature of this group today, it's worth noting that the author of the anti-Semitic paper, Edward Dutton, is the current editor of Mankind Quarterly, alongside Lynn. Now, should you see someone defending their decision to legitimise these ghouls by attending their conferences or citing their papers, you know exactly what sort of person you're dealing with. Remember, the science is fake, but the racism is very real.